G'day, I'm Paul. So Duke have utes are all the craze in Australia at the moment. And while this one here, the Volkswagen Amarok, has been out for ages now, it's one of the longest standing utes on the market. Volkswagen has been doing some local tuning here in Australia and they've developed this, which is the Amarok W580S. W stands for Walkinshaw, the company that has helped do some tuning here. And then 580S is the designation for the V6 diesel. It's priced at a little over 80 thousand uh, dollars if that's too expensive the whole amarok range kicks off at a little over 45 grand this competes with things like the ford ranger the toyota hilux the isuzu d-max there are a litany of competitors in the dual cab ute segment in australia today we're going to do a detailed review of this now you may be wondering why is paul not on his off-road track well that's because this is a road focused version of the amarok so we're here on a road track if you do want to skip ahead to other parts of the review you can use the time codes on the screen or if you're on YouTube scroll down and use the chapters below and if you haven't done so already subscribe to our channel press the bell icon that's going to tell you every single time we drive a car with black stripes. Now let's talk design. You've got five external colors to pick from. All but white is an additional $710. So the W580S brings with it stripes. You can see them here on the bonnet. You've got this bonnet protector. This has a full black package as well. So offsetting the body color, you have these piano black highlights and then black sections down the bottom as well. Tell you what, the design here of the Amarok, despite the fact this is like 11 or 12 years old now here in Australia. I think it still actually looks like a really cool ute. Now, if you don't know, Volkswagen will be sharing a platform with Ford on the Ranger for the next generation of the Amarok. So we expect to see that here later this year or early next year. So it will be kind of same, same, but different. They'll apply their own flair and hopefully they continue with these cool sort of special editions. So being the V6 diesel, you get the V6 badge up the top here, by Zen and headlights, that's how old this car is with LED daytime running lights. You also have LED fog lights down the bottom there. And we'll whip around to the side, now this is where things get interesting. You've got these wheel arch extensions here and they contain this tire. So it's a Pirelli Scorpion. It's kind of like a, an off-road tire with on-road focus. So it's a tire that you can use on-road and gives this car a little bit more traction. So 275 mil wide on each end, 20 inch alloy wheels. Quite like the alloy wheel design. So you've got that uh, sort of matte black finish to it. Volkswagen caps over here on the lug nuts and then the Volkswagen logo in the center there. Uh, the suspension has changed in this and this is part of the tuning program that Walkinshaw did. So they've gone with the 35 mil damper, which is around 10% bigger than the standard car. That gives them more variability to tune the vehicle across different surfaces. So we'll be testing that out today when we take it for a spin and I'll be keen to see how it goes over our sine waves to see how well it settles over that. It's also 50 mil higher at the front due to that suspension setup up that they've gone for. You've got a V6 badge over here, more 580 with Walkinshaw on the side there, so everyone knows what you're driving. You've got these rock sliders down the side of the car as well. Privacy glass. You have body colored sailplane that comes standard, more of that wheel arch extension here, and then come around to the back. Now, before I show you all this stuff, have a look under there. You've got a tuned twin exhaust system, so I'll be keen to see whether that sounds any cool, and it's got the side exit pipes which is um, very American of that setup. So another Walkinshaw badge just here. Then you've got Amarok in black lettering with a big Volkswagen logo. You have a three and a half ton brake to towing capacity, which is good news. Normally when they soup these utes up, you lose your towing capacity, but this retains that. Now inside the box here, you've got an Amarok badge, a 12 volt outlet, some hooks, Payload comes in at just under 850 kilos. And then in terms of the dimensions of the tray, it has a load length of a little over 15, 50 millimeters. And then you have just over 1200 millimeters between the wheel arches. It also has a torsion bar as well, which means getting this up and down is a little bit easier. Now, let me know what you think about the design of the W580S and do you reckon $81,000 is too much to pay for a ute that is 10 years old. Let me know what you think. Right, so we're inside the Amarok. Let's start off with the key. Lock, unlock, then on the back, Volkswagen. And it's a flip out key. And that is because it's not proximity sensing. You've got to press a button to unlock it. And then once you're inside, you have a keyhole. So it is very old school. Okay, so let's talk about the design. Now I've entered this in the frame of mind that this car is 
what, 11, 12 years old now for the Australian market. So it is very old compared to most of its other competitors. And that's why you'll see things like these very scratchy surfaces all over the place, tiny infotainment system and, and barely any safety technology that I'll get to in a second. Um, but if you keep that in mind, I still think that it is nicely presented. So everything is where you need it. The climate controls are easy to reach. Everything is just sort of in the spot you'd expect it to be in. And I think until the new Amarok comes, uh, the one that's going to be sharing a platform with the Ranger, this is going to tide them over. So what are the touch points like? It's firmish and then firm on the door. How firm are they? Well, we've got our gyrometer. We've tested the main surfaces in this cabin. If you want to see how this car compares to others that we've tested before, have a look at the link in the description. By the way, um, somebody asked us how this actually works. It just measures from zero to 100, where 100 is maximum hardness and zero is super soft. So that's what the numbers on the screen mean. Now, what about build quality? That's a little bit wonky there but the rest of it feels pretty solid. Let me know, have you owned an Amarok? I'm sure some of you have. Uh, let me know in the comment section below, what's it been like to live with and has it been reliable? Door test. Let me get rid of that first. Sounds nice and solid. Let's talk about infotainment. You almost need like a magnifying glass to see the screen. It's 6.3 inches, it's absolutely tiny. Um, but I guess it comes with all the features that you need, plus a CD player. I haven't seen a CD player in a while. So inbuilt satellite navigation, uh, and then in terms of audio, you have AM, FM, DAB plus digital radio. And that's all through a six speaker sound system. Sound system is meh, it's kind of okay, nothing too special. But you can mirror your smartphone here. And this is probably what makes this such a usable system because it means that you, know, you can just put whatever you want uh, on your smartphone and then it kind of makes the infotainment system and its age obsolete. So I'll show you what Apple CarPlay looks like. Both Apple CarPlay and Android Auto are wired. Nice and fast, quick and easy to use. You also have voice recognition that interacts with the phone there as well. I'll show you what Android Auto looks like. So again, full screen integration and nice and quick and easy to use. The other cool thing as well, it has a memory card here. So uh, that is for the satellite navigation, but you've got another slot. You can load pictures and stuff like that. And if you want, um, yeah, I don't know why you'd want to have pictures on your screen, but uh, you can do that and um, it's all fun. Uh, now, there is one more screen ahead of the driver. It's just a tiny little display that has your trip computer information. And then when you do engage some of the off-road settings, it appears uh, both on the sides here with the taco and the speedo. And then you get some information in the center of the display there as well. But it is a pretty basic setup here in terms of infotainment. Now, Safety technology. Um, this has virtually no safety technology. So you've got no autonomous emergency braking, low, no lane departure warning, no lane keeping assistant, no blind spot monitoring. You don't even have airbags for the second row. So from a safety point of view, this car is thoroughly disappointing. It did score five stars when it was crash tested in 2011, but that was over 10 years ago. So um, yeah, it is disappointing. They haven't put any effort into updating it on the safety front. Uh, yes, there is another model coming, but it is worth keeping that in mind. If you're gonna have kids in the car, there is no airbag coverage for the second row. But you do have front and rear parking sensors and a reverse view camera. I'll show you what that looks like. There it is there. So yeah, camera is not too bad. It's got guidelines as well. And then on top of that, you have front and rear sonars there that show you exactly what's going on. The view is, is fine. It's actually quite a decent quality camera there. So that's not too bad. Now, what about your practicality? And we'll start off with the connectivity option. So you have one USB port down the front here. That's used for your smartphone mirroring and then an auxiliary app outlet, two 12 volt outlets here. In terms of phone storage, your phone can you know, kind of live anywhere really. There's no wireless phone charging, but there's a big old pad down there. You can also fit it in the cup holders, should you wish. Now, speaking of cup holders, coffee cup, how does that go? It doesn't quite reach the bottom. So if you have a small coffee cup like I do, it's gonna be a little bit tricky for that. There's no teeth there either, but we'll have a look at how it goes with our water bottle. It's fine, but without the teeth, it sort of moves around a little bit. Uh, plenty of storage inside the doors. I'm curious, is it gonna fit our big bottle? Not there, but yes, inside the door, no dramas at all. Now, what about the rest of your storage? So center console here, there's barely any room in there and that's because it has a traditional handbrake that eats into that space. Uh, now the glove box, that's positively small there, but you do have this storage up the top that has another 12 volt outlet and then you have a sunglasses holder as well. 
So what about your comfort? That's important while you're driving around in your big truck. Uh, so dual zone, automatic climate control up the front here. You have heated seats for the front row. The seats are electrically adjustable. That means you can go forwards, backwards. Backrest can go forwards, backwards. The base can come up and down like that. You also have lumbar support as well. So it's a pretty impressive seat setup. It's quite a comfy seat too. It hugs you in nicely. In terms of the seat design, you've got the big Walkinshaw logo up the top there. And then the seat itself is sort of just nice. It just hugs you in and it's comfy for a long distance drive. Now you're steering. It has both tilt and reach adjustment. And then on our reach test, all of this stuff is easy to reach while you're driving. Now, before I show you how much room there is, let's have a look at the storage options. So if you lift the seat, it's interesting. There's you know, what you would assume is storage under here, but the seat lifts out of the way so you can store longer items that don't have to rest on your fancy Vienna leather. Uh, both sides lift up and both of them have that little hook to get all that into place. Now, behind here is your jack and other recovery items. So the problem is you need two people to open it. So Sean, can you carefully grab that end at the same time? There it is. So once that's back, you can see your jack in here and then I don't even know what that is. It's like a little soft case of some sort behind there. And you'll also find your top tether points here as well. All right, let me hop in, handle. All right, yes. Now this is what I remember with Amarok. It is really wide, so you have plenty of room to sit with your mates sideways, but you well and truly wedge yourself into that seat when you're sort of back here. You can see I have no knee room. Toe room's great though, and headroom is pretty good as well. In terms of other creature comforts, there really isn't much back here. You've got a 12 volt outlet. There's no USB charging ports, no air vents. Your bottle can go down here in one of those cup holders, or alternatively, it can go inside the door pocket. And outside of that, you really don't have much else. You've got isofix points here uh, to match those top tethers. And finally, our window test. Let's see how it goes. Oh, look at that. Old school use. Window goes down all the way. Win-win. So I've just hit the road in the Amarok W580S. It is so wet out here. It's just been bucketing down all morning. So um, yeah, get that in mind when you see the surrounds here. Um, now powering this, it's one of the few utes in this segment. Actually, I think it's the only ute in the segment at the moment that is powered by a V6 diesel. There was for a brief period the Mercedes-Benz X-Class, but now I think this is the only one. Now it's a three liter turbocharged V6 diesel. It's able to produce 200 kilowatts of power briefly on overboost. So that occurs when you go to full throttle and that's matched with 580 newton meters of torque, which is a very nice big serve of torque there, especially in a vehicle like this that has permanent all wheel drive. So when you are driving it, you really do feel that push in the back. It's not like a lot of the other utes in the segment that are rear wheel drive until you activate all wheel drive. And what does all that feel like behind the wheel? We'll give this a punch. Yeah, look, it feels good. There is a fair bit of lag there though. So if I slow this back down again, and then we just give it a punch. Waiting, 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 then it goes. So there is a little bit of lag, but once it's moving, it's moving. That's all mated to an eight speed torque converter automatic. So no dual clutches here. Gearbox is fast enough, but you will notice if you do catch it napping, it takes a little bit of time to get its, its thoughts into gear. Volkswagen claims a combined fuel economy of 9.5 liters per 100 Ks. We are currently sitting on 12.1, so a little bit higher than the average claim, but you know, near enough. Now, one thing you will notice is every time I go for that throttle, there is a little bit of noise in the cabin. It is a fairly noisy engine. Uh, there is a twin exhaust system out the back, and I am curious what it sounds like from the outside, because when you get onto the throttle here, it actually sounds pretty good. It sounds like it's actually doing stuff. It doesn't sound like a rattly four cylinder diesel, uh, but I'm hoping it sounds good on the outside as well. They've gone to such a big effort there with that exhaust system. Now, Volkswagen claims a zero to 100 time of 7.3 seconds. This is how it went up against our stopwatch. Keep in mind, it is wet outside. Now let's talk about the ride. So Walkinshaw did the tuning on the ride here to differentiate it from just the standard Amarok. And as part of that, 
they've kind of firmed it up to give it that sporty feel and we're coming up to our sine waves here which I'll attack at country highway speeds or the maximum speed you can do here in Australia which is 130 Let's dial up the speed a little bit whoa, whoa, that is pretty floaty it's interesting because at low speed it actually has a fair bit of firmness to the ride and I mean you you're kind of dealing with a platform here that is quite old it's leaf sprung at the rear there's only so much you can do with it but then when you hit those continuous undulations at speed it starts to get really floaty over those so look the ride's good but I really don't think it's amazing I think there could be a little bit of work done to that to either smooth it out or I don't know it's, it's kind of a little too sporty at the moment but doesn't have the sportiness at the top end of town now there isn't a sport mode so to speak but there is a sport mode for the gearbox so i've just slotted it into that makes it a little more eager to dial back through the gears and to give you everything that you need yeah even with these tires it you know it actually I, it, I was driving around here this morning when it was dry and it actually had a fair bit of traction and that's the thing when you're talking a v6 diesel this piles on the speed pretty quickly but without traction and grip, you're kind of nowhere. And these tyres, they've fitted to it in the dry, they're actually really impressive. But here in the wet, they are just a little bit sketchy. This surface isn't fantastic, so you know, you've know got to give it to that as well. But um, look, for the most part, when you do dial up the speed, it actually has an impressive amount of traction in the dry for what is a giant dual cab ute that sits pretty high off the ground. Okay, let me put this back into just the normal driving mode. Now let's talk about road noise. So I spoke about the engine being a little noisy, but what's it like in terms of road noise? Surprisingly, there isn't a great deal of noise coming in through the tires. They are technically an all-terrain tire, but even here at highway speeds, it's not that bad. I was expecting to hear a whole lot more noise coming into the cabin, especially on this coarse chip stuff. A little bit of wing noise coming in over the mirrors there, but for the most part, it's actually not too bad in here visibility out of the cabin so out the front there is excellent it's a massive window the wing mirrors are massive and I love that because you can really see down the sides of the car there visibility out the back is good as well now let's talk about steering as well this is one of the things that ultimately they can't do a great deal with because it's still a hydraulically assisted steering rack and here about center and even just off center there's really barely any steering feel, so there's a whole lot of play in that wheel. And once the speeds do start to pick up, you really do notice that there isn't a great deal of feel through that steering wheel. So that's obviously something that'll get addressed when they move to the Ford Ranger platform because it uses an EPAS system, an electrically assisted steering rack. But here for the moment, you're not really gonna feel a whole lot of what's going on under the, under the body there. Now let's talk about off-road specs. I mentioned earlier that yes, we normally film our four-wheel drives and off-road cars at a dedicated location, but I thought we'd come out here today because this is the road-focused version. But the Amarok is actually pretty capable off-road. Click up here to watch our previous review of the Amarok that was off-road, and you can see some clever stuff like the off-road mode here that adjusts the braking performance depending on the surface. But in terms of your off-road specifications, it has an approach angle of 28 degrees and a departure angle of 23.6 degrees. They are the angles that you can uh, hit before you damage the car at the front and rear respectively. You have a weighting depth of 500 millimetres and a ground clearance of 258 mil and that is the amount of space you have beneath the car before it starts hitting things. And finally, instead of low range, you just have the rear diff lock and the eight speed auto is configured to have a really short first gear that kind of mimics a low range transfer case. Does an okay job. Um, Off-road, we've never really had any issues with the Amarok. It has one of the best electronics packages on the market. It really just varies that stability and traction control to keep you out of situations where you're likely to get stuck. Now, what's it like at low speeds? Well, turning circle is just over 12.4 metres, which is pretty big. And because it's a hydraulically assisted steering rack, the steering is pretty heavy when it comes to parking, but you do get front and rear parking sensors that makes getting it into tight spaces pretty easy. So the W580S, what do we reckon? Um, look, to be honest, I think it is really starting to show its age. I, I don't like that it has a huge lack of safety technology. Um, the ride I also don't really love either. I just think it's a little, it's neither here nor there. It sort of doesn't sit on any particular tangent. So it is a little bit 
hard to place it. But what does excite me is they've been able to do this here in Australia and it is hard to get these smaller engineering programs off the ground. And I'm hoping that once the new Amarok comes out with all of the safety features and all of the bells and whistles that Ford engineers have been working on on the side with the Volkswagen guys, that they can give this to Walkinshaw and they can come up with something fun. So let's see how that goes. Uh, but yeah, for the moment, I reckon 80 grand is probably a little bit rich for it. So let me know in the comments section, have you bought one? Is there something that I'm missing on it? Let me know your thoughts about the Amarok and the 580S in general. Now, if you did enjoy this video, please make sure you share it with your mates. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon. But until next time, take it easy.